welcome back to You Can Do STEM. My name is Jaylisa, and today I'm here with Anthony, who is a PhD candidate at the chemistry department at Yale. And today he's going to be sharing with us his journey as a doctoral student in chemistry. So welcome. Thank you, Jaylisa, for having me. I'm excited to be doing this. This yeah. is so exciting. That's great. Thank you for being here to empower, inspire, and support young minority students to pursue their careers in STEM. So let's start with a little bit of yourself, like where you're from and um, what are you studying? So uh, like Jaylisa said, my name is Anthony Screws and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in the chemistry department here at Yale. I'm from Springfield, Ohio, um, graduated from high school in 2010. And then I enrolled at Morehouse College, which is a historically black college in Atlanta, Georgia, and graduated from Morehouse in 2014 with a degree in chemistry. Then I applied to the Yale graduate program in chemistry and arrived here in 2014 and have been here ever since. Okay, so what are what is it that you're studying? Like, what's your research question? What <clears throat> you're passionate about? So uh, my PhD will be in organic chemistry. Specifically, I am studying the synthesis of complex natural products. And so what that means is uh, we study the ways that... Um, so we first look at a complex natural product that is made in nature. And usually these molecules have some sort of biological activity that we wish to take advantage of for medicinal or medical purposes. And usually, though, the species, the organism, either the plant or the fungus or the bacteria that makes these compounds does so in very small quantities. And so what we do as synthetic chemists, we look at the structure of those compounds, figure out a nice way to make them in the laboratory such that we can take advantage of the biological properties that I mentioned. And we usually do this in a way that involves the development of either new chemical transformations that have never been executed before, or oftentimes we use the route, synthetic routes that we develop to make a wide variety of different kinds of structures to try to improve upon the biological activities that they naturally have. So why do you think this is important? Well, this is important because um, I think a lot of people, if not every person, has come into contact with a some sort of pharmaceutical compound or some sort of over-the-counter drug, whether it's Tylenol for a headache or ibuprofen or aspirin or something like that, or if anybody takes prescription drugs on a daily basis for other health problems they may have. And in order to make new and improved drugs, or in, in even in some cases to make them more safe to take, it requires innovation in chemistry because chemistry is the underlying um, Chemistry is what makes the development of these compounds possible because we usually make them from scratch pretty much. And so uh, people who are trained in synthetic chemistry often go on into careers in these sorts of industries where these compounds are made or they go into academia where they help train new students to do this, to do this job as well. That's super cool. So what is it that you really, really like coming every day and do in lab? Like, what's so your favorite thing to do? My favorite thing to do in lab, um, I don't know. I really like, I like the idea of, I like that this, this career allows me to work with my hands and also allows me to solve puzzles on paper. So I think it's a really nice combination of, um, you know, working with your hands, setting up experiments, holding glassware, and also sitting at your desk thinking about ways to make these molecules, analyzing a really complex NMR spectrum, reading the literature, trying to mine new ideas. And so my favorite aspect about graduate school, I think, is the synergy between those two. I'm really into puzzles and creative thinking, but I also, I think I would get bored um, just sitting at my desk all day. So I like the idea that I'll be able to have an idea at my desk and immediately go into the lab and try that idea out. That's great. And this is, guys, what a PhD is. You normally come every day um, to solve new questions in very innovative ways. And that's why you never get bored. That's why you never get bored. <laughs> I, I've been in graduate school for almost five years now, and I've never been bored for one day of this process. That's awesome. So, okay, you have told us a little bit about, you know, where you came from and that you did your bachelor's degree. But I want to know, how did you know you wanted to do chemistry and, like, when was it around? What happened? So I had a really fantastic chemistry teacher in high school. In high school, I actually took three chemistry courses. I took the freshman biology course and then three uh, chemistry courses after that. So I've always sort of had a knack and an interest in, in chemistry. And in my senior year of high school is where I really decided that I wanted to pursue chemistry as a college major. And that's because in, uh, in that year, we did a couple of really interesting experiments where we actually synthesized the aspirin in our high school chemistry lab. And we also made um, super balls. So we, we did an experiment where we took, like, I forget what the polymeric material was, but we made a super ball that really couldn't bounce that well. But just the idea 
that you could actually make something in the lab of use in society. Uh, I really kind of um, really like that. And so I decided to go to college and major in chemistry. And then in college, I was in a couple of uh, research programs like the Hop Scholars program at Morehouse College and also the Mark program at Morehouse. And those were really geared toward getting um, specifically students from minority backgrounds on the track to a PhD to help diversify and improve the um, diversity of academia. Um, and so I got on the, I got into those programs at, at Morehouse. I did three different summer research experiences at um, Northwestern, Brown University, and then the Broad Institute. And those really gave me the, um, those really solidified my interest in, synth in synthetic chemistry. And so then I decided to pursue a PhD in this field after that. Did you, like, after those experiences, I guess, you also sort of figure it out not only that you wanted to do chemistry and synthetic chemistry specifically, but also kind of like what is the type of your work that you're willing to do um, yes. moving on and like yes. what type of, of mentors you would prefer and stuff like that. So yes. that probably helps you a lot. Yes, it definitely was. So for, for one thing, in my first RU at Northwestern, I did research in nanoparticle synthesis and I did not like that. I, I sort of missed the idea of, or I, I wasn't getting... I didn't get to look at organic molecules. It, was, it, was, it wasn't as exciting. I didn't really like the work. But the following research experience at Brown University, I worked with actually Morehouse alumnus uh, named Jason Sello. And at that experience, in that experience, I was designing peptide antibiotics, which was really interesting because it was a nice combination of synthetic chemistry and also an application to a biological problem. And then following that experience, I, I, I sort of really knew I wanted to go into synthetic chemistry with a sort of biological application because at the Broad Institute, I was um, designing these small molecule fragments to target an enzyme that's considered to be undruggable. And so at that point, I really got the bug for synthesis and, and designing compounds with biological activities and decided to do that here at Yale. We already talked about your summer experiences and how they have, you know, um, sort of been like the way that you chose your career and your subject of study. Um, and I wanted to ask you in your experience, what do you think you did during your college years that made you successful in pursuing your PhD career other than summer programs? So, hmm. Well, the summer programs were a big one because they gave me the research experience that I needed to be a successful applicant. And also they helped me realize that research is what I wanted to do. But aside from those, um, I think doing well in coursework uh, was helpful because uh, graduate school admissions uh, committees tend to look at GPA as an indicator of how well you'll do in graduate school. Certainly not the end-all be-all GPA, but it definitely helps to have one that is as high as possible. Um, I also did a little bit of research on campus at Morehouse, and that was helpful. Um, but yeah, I don't think, as aside from the summer opportunities, uh, I, I think that was probably the thing that helped me be most successful, actually. So in your career path, um, maybe from college till now that you're almost graduating, what has been the biggest challenge or challenges? So a big challenge that uh, I certainly face, and I think that most PhD students do face, is one called imposter syndrome. And that is this idea that you got into this program on a whim, or it was a fluke that you were admitted, and eventually the professors and the admissions committee will realize that they made a mistake and then kick you out of the program. The reality is that that is not the case. The review process and the way graduate students are chosen for these programs is often quite rigorous, and they, they only select people that they think will be successful. And so based on that, um, I did a lot of work convincing myself that I was, in fact, um, good enough to be here, they picked me for a reason, um, and that all, and that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm still doing the work to get over that imposter syndrome. It used to be, but it used to be uh, a lot worse, and I used to be really stifled at not knowing the answer and thinking that they were going to kick me out because I didn't know, or they were going to look at um, all, they were going to look at every, uh, every person from minority group differently because I didn't know the answer. And so that's been a, a real tough struggle, but um, I'm nearing the end. Um, not only have I, you know, I was admitted to this program, I've been successful and I'm nearing completion. So I think imposter syndrome is something that everybody deals with and even faculty members deal with. Everybody. Uh, but it's something that I think people have to be aware of first, that it's uh, a thing that can happen. And then try to figure out ways to help calm those feelings when they become too much. Right. And also even before um, you're applying to programs, I feel like a lot of people don't think that they can get into schools like, for example, right. Yale. Right. 
or other things. Like I was one of those and I didn't mm-hmm. think I was going to get in and I wasn't going to apply, but I did. And here I am. Yeah, here so we are. Here we both are. You just have to get rid of, of that imposter syndrome somehow and yeah. just keep going. That's great, Anthony. Um, well, so tell us a little bit more about what you're going to do next. What are your next steps? Um, yeah, so I've been talking about synthesis and biology and how I'm interested in both. And so uh, for my next opportunity, I will be pursuing a postdoc in medicinal chemistry at Vanderbilt University Well, I'll get to apply my synthetic skills to making compounds that hopefully will be perturbing the central nervous system and hopefully developing um, some new ways to to explore different diseases like Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, and Parkinson's disease. That is so exciting. Yes. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just to conclude a little bit um, your story, um, maybe if you have any advice for any student who is thinking on applying to any doctoral degree or maybe even master's in chemistry do you have any suggestions um, tips <laughs> so a suggestion i would have is try to get um, as much research experience as possible i think it helps with a knowing whether or not this is something that you want to do and b it also helps figure out what your interests are what kinds of experiments you like to do uh, what kind of lab you like to be in, what kind of environment you like what kind of mentor you'd like um, and a, a suggestion I would have, I have is um, it really helps to find a community of support. And that can look a number of different ways. That can be um, really supportive mentors, faculty mentors on campus. That can be a really supportive group of other graduate students on campus. And that can also be a really supportive group of friends that have nothing to do with academia or the university at all. It can be your family. It can be your chosen family, it can be whatever, whatever kind of group of whatever kind of support that you find is most helpful for you is, is very is very necessary in graduate school. This is a very long, arduous and sometimes really isolating process. And if you don't have people that you can lean on for support when times get tough, it will be very it can be very difficult to keep moving. Right. Um, and just to keep in those lines, maybe to finish. As minority students, sometimes we don't really find a lot of people in academia that we can see ourselves mm-hmm. into, like look up as roles. So do you have any suggestions for that for minority students watching? Yeah, so um, I think it's really helpful for minority scientists to attend meetings that meetings and conferences that are geared specifically for underrepresented minority students. And those would be meetings like Abracams, groups like SOCNES, where you'll meet other type other students that look like you and also other faculty attend those meetings as well. It's also nice to get involved, I think, with different um, affinity groups on campus or different um, national organizations for um, specific scientists. For instance, I'm a member of Nobiche, which is the National Organization for the Professional Advancement of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers. And attending that meeting was really formative in my graduate school career because it was the first time that I was able to present my research um, as a doctoral student to a group of other black chemists and get feedback uh, from other black chemists. And that was really nice to see that there were so many other people out there like me in the world, uh, whereas before I wasn't quite so sure. So I would definitely suggest getting involved with different affinity groups to find other minority scientists and also uh, being on the lookout for different scientists that you might meet at conferences or scientists that might visit your school to give seminars and other things like that. That's great. Well, thank you so thank much, you so for, much for having sharing me. Sharing your journey. Um, and thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope we'll see you next time because you can do STEM. Bye-bye. Bye.